old middle schoolers and high schoolers. So that's an, another one of the, the initiatives that we're doing to kind of uh, promote the STEM in the community and things like that, as well as joining robotics in your community. That is <laughs> so we host a, a bunch of events like host. Um, yeah, so by the way, please like um, uh, to preserve bandwidth for everybody, we will ask that you keep your video preserve off bandwidth. and you're still muted until the Q and A, which you can guys if you want, you can unmute it from there. Um, oh, and yeah, so we host a variety variety of events just like this. So we have a mailing list that if you want to be informed about these events, that you can be in as well. So I will put in the what chat um, the 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 link to that that if you want to join, um, you can do that. Okay. So there it is in the chat. It's the event mailing list. If you want to join, it would be very good. You could say, like, I guess you'd know about various events that we host. So with that aside, let's talk about our guest speaker today. So for the first session, we have J uh, we have Jason, Mr. Jason Andrews, who is a technical specialist for Microsoft. For the past two decades, he's done a bunch of things. He's done speech recognition, natural language understanding solutions, and other things that deal with machine learning and AI. So today, the title of this presentation is AI in Action, Real-World Applications and Machine Learning and na na nat Natural Language Understanding. So we're taking a look at all these things that we see in the newspapers, like AI and like machine learning, and thinking about how does it transform our lives from the healthcare industry to daily shopping. These are not just buzzwords, but they're integral forces driving the our growth in the society around us today. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Jason Andrews, Take it away. Thank you, Anush. I appreciate that introduction. I want to start off with this quote from John McCarthy, who famously said, as soon as it works, it's not called AI anymore. So for those of you who don't know who McCarthy was, he was actually a pioneer in the early fields of AI. In fact, he actually coined the term artificial intelligence in 1955. Um, he invented the Lisp programming language and won the prestigious Turing Award in 1971. So for those that don't know, the Turing test is basically a test where they go, is machine learning, is something that a computer can do, something that a person, a real life person would not be able to tell the difference between computer output and art or intelligence, if you will, something that was programmed. So he contributed to the AI landscape in a way, and I thought his, for you guys that are STEM students and for the guests, this would be a great way to start our discussion about AI in action and how it is being used in the world today. And before we dive in, um, just want to put a one in the chat if you have used ChatGPT, and put a two in the chat if you have never even touched ChatGPT or, or used it. So let's start seeing those numbers in to see how people are reacting. Okay, that's good. So we'll go ahead and just give you a little bit about me. Um, Anusha did a really good job of introducing myself, but I actually graduated from the University of North Texas in 2000, um, way back when the Y2K bug was going to doom us all. Clearly that did not happen. So we, we survived through that. I've seen a lot of different revolutions and evolutions in the tech space in my 23 plus career um, in technology. And what I didn't realize though, is when I started my first job right out of college in 2000, was that I was actually gonna be at the forefront, forefront of some of the very earliest releases and deployments of speech recognition and natural language. So anybody that's ever seen Star, Star Trek knows that the computer, the enterprise spoke to the crew and vice versa. Um, so my first job was working in IVRs, which I know everybody hates. I hate them myself. Um, but it, these things serve a useful function when you call your bank and you say operator, operator, operator. But if you play along with it, most of them today are going to ask you a question like, in a few words, tell me how I can help you. And that is the natural language understanding. And that is actually one of the very early uses of machine learning. So I was very fortunate to be able to I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back on it, I was very fortunate to be working in these types of technologies in a day where DTMF was still the rule of the day. And this was before Siri and Alexa made a mainstream like they are now. Put a, put a one in the chat if you have a Siri, if you use Siri on your phone or Alexa at home, um, and a two if you don't, just to give us a quick idea of how much people are using speech recognition at home. 
Um, a little bit more about me, as Anush said, I work for Microsoft now. I came through an acquisition of a company called Nuance that is was a major player in speech recognition. Um, and I'm also a real estate agent as my side hustle. Um, I work with my wife, May, who's also on the call supporting me. Um, we have a small real estate team that we run. Uh, and what you kind of like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, real estate is full of use cases where AI is coming into play. A lot of realtors aren't great at writing anything, so they're using it to write property descriptions. They're creating marketing plans, things that they would otherwise probably have to hire somebody else to do. Now they're able to leverage ChatGPT and other AI technologies to make their job more efficient. So what I wanted to do, um, I guess first, before we go too much further, I do work for Microsoft, but what I'm saying in this presentation is really my own personal thoughts. Microsoft hasn't endorsed this. If I say something about some Microsoft technology, they always have the right to pull the plug and not do it. I think they're gonna go forward with Copilot no matter what I say, but we'll, we'll talk about that more a little bit later. All right, so here's gonna be a little breakdown of the history, if you will, of artificial intelligence. In 1956 is kind of when the field got off to its start. And basically, they were just dreaming of like, how can we make things and machines that think more like a human? And really, back then, it was around symbolic AI. So it wasn't really like getting in kind of meaningful learning. It was really just trying to figure out how can we make it smarter and smarter. And then it progressed into, and by the way, I wasn't born in the 50s, so I, I didn't live through that. But I lived through the next level, which was the machine learning area which is really where things like speech recognition and using advanced analytics came in because you could start programming the computers where you didn't have to tell them A plus B equals C. You could start giving them data that they could learn on and they would train and you could start running that. And as the um, computer power became more and more, they became smarter and smarter. And that continued to evolve until we got into the age that we are kind of have been in in the last you know 10 or so years which is around deep learning and now most recently generative ai so most of you probably have heard about when um ibm released uh deep i think it was deep blue that was the the system that beat the jeopardy or sorry the beat the jeopardy champ and beat the computer pro, uh the world champions and computer the world champion chess players if i could speak there for a little bit uh, all of those things were kind of the forefront of where we are today, which is generative AI. So for those of you who have not played around or touched GPT, you probably at least heard about it. It is a, basically it is AI and it is using large language models to be able to create conversations that are truly revolutionary and the ability for it to learn what people are saying and actually go out and fetch data and provide reasonable and actually really good answers. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But what's important is just how quickly it has evolved. So this timeline gives you a little sense of just how rapidly our world is changing, especially when it comes to how AI is being used, specifically chat GPT. But for every chat GPT, there are hundreds of companies under that that are leveraging similar types of technology, bringing AI to the market. And there doesn't seem to be any withdrawal, if you will, of consumer demand for these types of products. So just to kind of cover the fact that it took 16 years from when the mobile phones were introduced for them to get over 100 million users. And basically like each evolution of these types of things took quicker and quicker. It only took two months two months for chat GPT to get to that 100 million user mark. And the main reason that it's so clear that the adoption happened is because of how incredibly useful and quite frankly, remarkable it is. Whether you want to write a poem, whether you want to do something else, I mean, whether you want it to teach you a class, your imagination for how you can tell it to do something, it is really the biggest limitation of what it can do. And then for what it doesn't do, there are a million or a lot of other technologies that will happen with that. So large language models are the artificial intelligence that produces the, the natural language text and the results. It's a, basically 
what we call in the space of natural or natural language understanding, it's a huge corpus of data. So that body of data has just grown. And the more data it gets fed, the better it's gotten and over time. So that's why it's so good at being able to understand, even if you make mis mistakes in the spelling, even if you put it in a weird order, it will learn. It basically understands what you're ultimately trying to do, that intent part of it. And it allows you to do all these different tasks between just answering a question, summarizing text, summarizing meeting notes that are recorded and the transcription is used for it, writing essays. Um, I don't encourage that for any of you that are still in school. You need to still write your own essays, but you can, there are opportunities to brainstorm with chat GPT. So one of the things I like to say is chat GPT can be your assistant. It can help you brainstorm what your ideas are. So if you've ever sat down, put it, Put a one in the chat if you've ever been assigned an essay or some kind of work, and as soon as you pull out the paper, your mind goes blank. You could ask ChatGPT, hey, give me a list of 50 interesting topics that have been in the news. Then you can help explore, like, which one of those is interest to you? And then you can help it. It can help you drill down into stuff. So don't ask it to write for you, but I think it's perfectly legitimate to use it to brainstorm with you. And we can talk about that a little bit later. So going back a little bit to the language models. So starting in before really 2018, the language model size was 340 million parameters of data that were being used to, at the time, the BERT large model, which was state of the art. So 2018, not that long ago. 20, gotta go backwards, uh -oh, sorry. 2018 or 2020, um, the next evolution came about and it went to 17 billion. So more, way more than doubled in size. Um, I'm not great at math, so I'm not going to try to do that. My wife will tell me what it was in a little bit. Um, and then in 2000, when or 2020, when GPT-3 was introduced, it went all the way up to 175 billion parameters. So as that language model increases, it's gotten better and better. Now, there's some interesting conversations that are going on that I don't get to get into the weeds with, but I kind of understand what's happening with them. And I think that there's a perception right now that we're almost at a point where there's not a lot more you can do with actually the language models themselves, that that much more data is not going to provide that much more incremental capacity. But that doesn't mean that there's still not more room for growth in AI. And I think we are in, and especially you guys that are in school now, the world you're going to live in as far as what you're going to be able to do is going to probably better than like anything that we see on Star Trek, just saying. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this data, and I can't go into the details of how to explain it, but as complicated as and as knowledgeable, if you will, as ChatGPT is, it's still not actually comparable to what a human brain actually does from a pure processing horsepower perspective. So just think that in consideration, what our body is doing to run all these things actually is really still more complicated and more powerful than what chat GPT is. Maybe someday it won't be, but it is still right now. Um, so I think the easiest way to think about language now, especially with the chat GPT is Think of it like a calculator, a really big language calculator. And the reason I say that is how it works is you give it a query. You go, I, I will my sleeping bag work for my trip to Begonia next month? So there's lots of different things that are in that. The sleeping bag, a trip, Patagonia, a time. So then what ChatGPT is doing is going through what are the relevant pieces of that? It's pulling out what we call semantic tags. So weather, what's the weather like in Padonia? It's gonna be a trip. Who is it? Who is the user in this? What kind of information do we know about the user so that we can make a recommendation? What is the intent mapping? So what do they really wanna know? In this case, they wanna know, is it gonna be hot or cold so that whatever my sleeping bag is, is going to be comfortable when I go to sleep at night? So there's a lot of things that come out of that and it gets run through the large language model. 
And then it spits out, yep, your elite sleeping bag is going to work because the mean temperature in that area, blah, 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 is, is going to be the right temperature. So all of those things are happening behind the scenes. And where the really smart people are is in the fine tuning and the training of the models. That's about 10% of the work that is done, but is the most important and critical. The prompt engineer, how you craft your prompts, how you ask GPT or any of the AI technologies that are out there to provide you the result and what your data is, that's where the that's really where the bulk of everything comes in. And there's lots of different things where right data is the new king, but that's a whole nother discussion. So next I want to transition, and maybe this is a good point or a good part to pause. Are there any kind of questions about the evolution and history? And then we can start going into some of the discussion and showing a little bit of the demos about how some of the technologies are out there from healthcare and what some of the stuff that I work on in the enterprise side and then just um, experimenting with chat GPT. Were there any questions? Jason, I think I see a question in the chat. It asks, how does chat GPT base, base its ethical calculations? So um, it tries to dodge these types of moral questions, but will make serious moral decisions like when I ask you about the trolley problem. So the trolley. You, I'm not sure what the trolley problem is. Oh, um, is this referring to the problem where like there's a car and then there's like, it's kind of like the train problem where there's, it could. Be oh, okay. So like, do, yeah. do I, do I, if I'm in the trolley and I'm under, the, if it's AI do, and I go off the rails for whatever reason, but I can still control braking, and, but I am running into a crowd. Do I, how do I pick which crowd I go into that kind of thing? Yeah. I'm assuming that's. Okay. Yeah, so um, that's at a much deeper level than where I am. Um, I will paraphrase kind of Microsoft has a very large responsible AI um, program. I can tell you to get anything that we're doing with AI out the door. It goes through a pretty rigorous testing around, um, you know, what things it can say, what kind of responses. In the enterprise world specifically, there are safeguards about how your data is protected and stored. Um, there are other things around um, just making sure that the content is right. Also uh, accounting for like, how does it deal with bias um, to make sure that it's equitable? So there is a whole, and I can find this and send it to, um, to Isaac or Anoush, basically kind of outlining the response, ethical AI standards that Microsoft has. OpenAI is a different company, so they have some different, you know, guiding principles. And there's a lot of things you can do with ChatGPT itself that you probably wouldn't be able to do in an enterprise instance of it. So I don't know that that fully answered the question, but it's a really, it is something that most companies are grappling with. And I can just tell you, we see this from our side, my side in the sales field that a lot of customers want to go really fast. And there are a lot of our competitors like, oh, we can do this, this, and this, but they haven't really grappled with those, those questions. Ah, does it mean censorship? I see that one popping up. Um, I, I would say, I guess it could, but it also depends on what, now you're going to get into an ethical situation again. Uh, can a company create censorship or is censorship really like a First Amendment right for the government? And I think that there are lots of interesting conversations on that. I don't have a well-founded view on it, but I definitely think that these are all really great questions that are dealing with the ethics and morality of AI for sure. And I mean, I think it's a good point, like Microsoft or the people that own OpenAI decide that they don't wanna hear certain things and, you know, that's that is a possibility, but again, I would just go back. I don't. Microsoft has a policy for ethical AI, and um, I actually just finished reading Satya's book about um, hit reset, and I can tell you that my perspective of it was that he's very much um, a believer in freedom of the press and freedom of speech. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. Shall we move on?
Okay. Oh, uh, good clapping. Oh, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, so I'm going to play this clip. And this is an example of a technology that the company I worked with that actually got acquired by Microsoft. Um, it's called, was called Nuance. Now it's part of Mac Microsoft. This is called the Dra um, Dragon Ambient Experience. It was called, it's called DAX for shorthand. This is from Michigan Health um, West. And this is actually like a promotional video that they published on their own. It's out on YouTube, um, but it does a really good job of describing how this solution works. And essentially, one of the things that we know, if you've been to the doctor recently, chances are you waited in the lobby for you know five to 30 minutes. You waited in the waiting or in the actual exam room for a few minutes. Maybe a nurse came in, took some vitals, then you waited, and then you got to talk to the doctor. And the doctor is like on their device, writing some stuff down. They'll look up and ask you a question. And then they'll go back to typing something or doing something on the computer and ask you a question. So what this solution is doing is essentially taking that in-personal experience and making it so that there's actually a com conversation going on between the physician and the, um, the, the patient in the office. So I'm going to hit play. If you don't hear it play within like the first five seconds, somebody let me know. At University of Michigan Health West, we believe each patient deserves our undivided attention. That's why we are leading the way with technology that takes notes automatically so we can focus on you. Your blood pressure looks great. 117 over 52. Yes, I do feel like The I system creates a secure medical record while you discuss your health. No keyboard, no typing, just a conversation. Oh, you'll be glad to hear that I've been keeping up with my exercise and medication. Well, you look fantastic. Let's put that medication refill in for you. At University of Michigan Health West, our innovations change care. Our care changes lives. And our focus is on you. So this is that is an experience that actually is being rolled out um, to various healthcare organizations. Um, the data that we are seeing essentially, in addition, I mean, the biggest benefit for it is from a practical standpoint, it's actually helping the number one complaint that patients have, which is that they don't actually get to spend enough time with their doctor and it's not quality conversation, that the doctor is usually distracted or doing other things. And this is really kind of revolutionizing that and letting the doctor and patient actually have honest and real conversations. Um, I can just tell you, like when I grew up, if somebody would said that there's going to be a device that's recording everything that you're saying uh, to your doctor, there would have been screams of big brother. Um, but we're at a different age now. And that's just a function of how technology changes over time. Uh, but the other thing about this that is maybe more revolutionary on the healthcare side of it is on average, the doctors that have been using this technology are actually able to see five more patients a day, which if you think about just how overcrowded um, healthcare is, that's a really amazing statistic. So the next one I'm going to go over, and this goes into a little bit to the weeds. So we'll try to keep it high level to the extent that we can. Um, but I'm gonna show a clip in a minute about how we are using machine learning to, in a contact center space to automate self-service, basically by mimicking what the best agents that a company has um, based on their transcripts of phone calls. So understanding what the conversation between the user and the agent are to be able to better automate. So the first thing is we're getting all of the conversations from the agent and the user. We're going through a process called clustering. And essentially what that is going to do is it's going to filter all of it and find what are the common threads? How are people asking for the same thing in a different way? And how many different things are people trying to do? So that clustering is the kind of the middleman, if you will. If you will. That's where the brains is coming in to figure out what's going on. And then what it's going to do is produce a bunch of solution sets, which are all the different ways. So if you think of a top agent that's answering any kind of questions, it's going to get all of those and the specific flow of how they responded to those questions. And then what we're able to do then is take that around and put it into our technology so that we can create custom flows 
that are very based and very um, not linear and not static, but based on what the best agents are doing to solve problems for the people that are calling into the to system. So on the next one, this is going to be a banking example. It's about a minute and a half of an audio clip about how this is being can be used in an enterprise system um, where people are calling into a contact center because they have some kind of problem. Um, there's a little bit of an Easter egg in here about a fairly recent popular movie. Thanks for calling Woodgrove Bank. Hi, Andy. I see you recently contacted us regarding refinancing a variable rate loan. Is that what you're calling about today? Yes. And then I'd also like to discuss a new account for my daughter. Great. I see you recently spoke to Tom regarding your loan. He is available tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. at our city center location. Can I schedule this for you and send you a meeting invite for this appointment, which will include the address? Yes, that works for me. Hey, by the way, what did you think of the Barbie movie? Interesting question on my thoughts about the Barbie movie, but before we get there, let's discuss the new account for your daughter. Tom can also support this request. Can you please provide some details about what you are looking for, so I can provide that information to the team? She's 16 and just started her first job. I'm looking for an account where she can make a direct deposit from her paycheck, get a debit card, and start investing. Okay. Great. I will make sure that Tom understands that you are interested in opening a new checking account for your daughter with a new debit card and easy access to investing. In preparation for that meeting, I will send you a link which will include a few recommended account options. That would be great. Fantastic. And about that Barbie movie, I thought it was like a baby unicorn, both magical and adorable. So I don't know who uh, watched the Barbie movie. I still haven't seen it, so I don't know. But there are a couple of different things in there. And I've been in this space for a very long time, but everybody's probably called their bank and gets like some kind of standard menu options. The ability for the technology to now have a much better conversation and be able to do things that it hadn't previously been able to do is, is really impressive. And um, I'm really excited about the capabilities of this. Oops. So I'm going to show you the next one. So this is going to be, I'm going to show you a kind of a different example, but in the same space, which is self-service. And so just to kind of keep everybody a little bit engaged. So drop a chat or drop a one in the chat if you've ever used a web or a digital virtual assistant chatbot or VA um, and a two if you haven't. So this scenario is going to be for that. And one of the things we're doing with AI is we're actually able to take a company's, um, and this is going to be a like a big box retailer, we're able to take like their website and then basically map it all out, print product pages for each of their products to a PDF, use ChatGPT to basically scan through that, tokenize all of the different information in it that's relevant to like a normal type search, and then um, use cognitive or Azure Cognitive Services to really kind of help put the final icing on the cake. And then we've created, um, this is just one part of it, but a really killer prompt that tells it exactly what to do and the kind of key things that it needs to, to learn and know about. And what that does is create a, a very unique experience. Um, this is still pretty much in its infancy and there's some visuals that, you know, in, a, in an ideal deployment would be better. But I think you'll see uh, this kind of come to life in this, this chatbot example. Introducing the ultimate shopping co-pilot. Meet Monica, a mom with a mission. She's surprising her son Nathan with an Xbox for his birthday. She's also planning to upgrade their TV, but she feels a bit lost. She sees a new shopping co-pilot on her favorite store and decides to try it out. She simply explains her needs in her own words, and voila, our co-pilot enhances her experience with her purchase history. Monica can change her mind, ask questions, and get advice whenever she wants. Our co-pilot provides enriched text 
delivering personalized generative recommendations and exciting content for Monica to explore. As she picks the perfect TV, she's thrilled to discover relevant discounts on related accessories she'll need to set it up. With her shipping complete, Monica leaves with a big smile on her face, feeling confident about her purchase and grateful for all the time she saved. So there's a lot of cool things in there that may have gone over just because it, it was a little bit of a quick, um, it's kind of got some slow parts and some fast parts. But just the ability, like if you think of your normal shopping experience where you select three different things and you get a big drop down of all the different features and functions in it, having this more natural language experience with the VA is, is really kind of revolutionary. Um, we had to show it the way that it works, you know, right now with our existing technology. But like the hope is that if you've ever used Bing Chat, it's going to actually have its own, you know, kind of first party sidebar, if you will to be able to handle those kind of things. So then the last one that I have, well, I actually have two parts of this for the co-pilot. I have, um, I'm going to give you a little bit of just like the high level overview. Uh, this gives you a better sense for what Microsoft is doing and is going to be releasing at the 1st of November. Um, if anybody has an educational account, I think that they're going to get this as well. Uh, but a lot of the enterprise customers are going to have to pay, but I, I can go a little bit deeper into this as well with like a little bit of a live demo. I can show you what I can do in the PowerPoint. Uh, but this is the co-pilot. So Microsoft is launching this November 1st. And what it's going to do is add um, basically chat GPT functionality into all of the Office products. There's something like 350 different co-pilots that are underway. But your most common ones like Word, PowerPoint, Excel are going to be the ones that are the first ones out there. And it's pretty, it's going to revolutionize, in my opinion, the way that people do work. It's going to change it substantially. Microsoft 365 Copilot is powered by what we call the Copilot system, a sophisticated processing and orchestration engine. It harnesses the power of three foundational technologies, the Microsoft 365 apps, that's Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, Teams, and more, the Microsoft Graph, that's all your content and context, your emails, files, meetings, chats, and calendar. And a large language model, or LLM, a creative engine capable of parsing and producing human-readable text, all accessible through natural language. It starts with a prompt from you in an app. Copilot pre-processes the prompt through an approach called grounding. Put simply, grounding improves the quality of the prompt, so you get answers that are relevant and actionable. One of the most important parts of grounding is making a call to the Microsoft Graph to retrieve your business content and context. Copilot combines this user data from the graph with other inputs to improve the prompt. It then sends that modified prompt to the LLM. You may be familiar with what an LLM can do based on your experience with ChatGPT or Bing Chat. Copilot takes the response from the LLM and post-processes it. This post-processing includes additional grounding calls to the graph, responsible AI checks, security, compliance and privacy reviews, and command generation. Finally, Copilot sends a response to the user and commands back to the apps. Copilot iteratively processes and orchestrates these sophisticated services to produce a result that feels like magic. So just a quick, um, this is like less than 15 or 20 seconds. So this is just, I had to be careful what I could show with Copilot and feel comfortable with because obviously I'm at Microsoft and I have tons of emails. So I didn't want to disclose anything that I, I could get in trouble for. Uh, so this is just the benign one, but this is basically using Word and Copilot to be able to create a very quick summary of what ChatGPT or what Copilot can do. You'll notice that I gave it two pages, it gave me four, so it likes to be verbose. But you can always go in and edit it, 
Um, it's, it's very powerful when you think about just how quickly it can write something. Uh, I, I'm a big believer, and I hear this all the time, so I, I will definitely say it as well. Just because it gives you something does not mean that it is the best content. It's still up to you. If you're using it anyway, you need to go proofread the word because you'll find mistakes. You'll find things where it's what they call hallucinations. So you do need to check the word because it will tell you some stuff that might not be 100% accurate. In the case of most stuff internal, like for us, it's pretty accurate in that it's not hallucinating that much because of the power of it. it's basically integrated into all of the Outlook or all of the Microsoft products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's using our own data and it can do all kinds of great stuff from like a calendar perspective of give me a summary of the most important emails I need to read this morning. So you don't even have to read the emails necessarily. So it's there's a lot of power in it. And we're going to go through some period of time where we're actually learning how to to talk to it and give it direction on what we want to do. Uh, but it's already really, really pretty powerful. So I have a couple of examples for prompt writing because I thought that was important, but I thought that if everybody's okay, unless there's some questions, maybe we could just give you a little bit of a live demo. I can pull up the PowerPoint that I have and kind of show Copilot in action. Or um, I guess let's say it this way, put a one in the chat if you would like for me to show like co-pilot using the PowerPoint that I just presented, um, just to do some kind of trivial things, but show you how it can work or do something with chat at GPT with how to write better prompts. Uh, Jason, I think we have a few questions. Do you want to answer yeah. those? Yeah. Um. So the first one is biases are inherent in feeding data to AI. What are some current biases? I mean, there's all kinds of biases. I <laughs> This is where you're getting out of, like this is an ethical field and ethical question. And I'm really not the best, per not that I'm not ethical, um, but I can't tell you what all that they're looking at at a lower level about how to do it and what they're on, you know, watching out for. I would just give you an example from the news. Um, this was really with the image creator. So if you're not familiar, there's a, in Bing chat, you can actually go in and ask it to create a image for you. And somebody posted or actually made a request of like Mickey Mouse flying into two large towers in New York, which obviously made it look like it was Mickey Mouse, which is trademark infringement because it's Mickey Mouse. And um, obviously it it's very hurtful, especially because I think it was in September with 9-11 um, so while not ethical, is definitely insensitive. And I know that they went in pretty quickly. And you know, some people said that Microsoft was muzzling it, but essentially they modified some of the material, one, to protect from a copyright standpoint, um, but two, to like that's a sensitive topic. And obviously the, there's still ways around it. If somebody wants to hack it, they're going to be able to find a way. Uh, sorry, I saw there's something else about. Oh, okay. Seven-year-old asking. Um, so I can tell you there are people that what are called AI ethicists, and they're the ones that are feeding the model. And the, I would say that we've learned a lot. So I, I'm going to use another kind of negative Microsoft thing. Um, and I think it was 2017, they launched a chat bot on Twitter called Tay. And it fed all the data. So if any, I don't, if anybody's on Twitter, it can be a very negative place. And it took less than 24 hours of it to be, for it to be basically turned upside down. And I think Microsoft learned a lot of lessons from that experience. And they're very committed to responsible AI. And I certainly don't have the the uh, the the right like all the fine level things, but those are really actually excellent discussions. And there's probably not an ultimately final right answer for it. So I see another one, how the companies ensure that chat GPT technologies are trained with accurate data. So there's a couple of different things. Chat GPT itself has, it tells you a certain time period in which it's being trained for. Um, it used to be that it was like 2021 was as far back as it, or as recent as it got with any data. Um, 
from an enterprise standpoint, there's a couple of different things. So ChatGPT is very generalized, but companies like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, everybody has their own kind of AI engines are doing something different, but probably very similar. And they're controlling what data gets fed into. I can tell you that when we work with our enterprise customers, um, it's not so much about the general information, it's really about the specific information. So if we're working with a big box retailer, uh, they don't want their big box competitor information to show up. So we're hyper-focused on only giving them the data that comes from their data sets. So in, in our space in contact center and self-service, that's where that data is coming from. So um, it's less about the garbage on the internet Preventative from the generative AI, I, I don't know what a, what open AI's safeguards are for that and how they determine it. Yeah, um, another question is, could the solution clustering that you mentioned previously take away jobs by removing uh, the need to hire somebody, like basically stuff like that? Um, yes. I mean, the, the short answer is it will probably have an impact on jobs in one way or another. I would also caution that is that every major technology revolution, it's been said that, oh, it's it's going to do away with jobs. I used to work at a bank and this was in the early 90s and ATMs were really, I mean, they've been on the scenes for a while, but they were really becoming widely adopted. And everybody said, there's going to be, we're going to lose all these teller jobs. And they did lose teller jobs. But those tellers went on to do other things for the most part. Uh, so at the bottom line of it is most of the changes in technology have repositioned people. I actually just made a post on LinkedIn about this the other day that AI is not really coming for your job. But if you're not effective at using AI, you're probably going to have a harder time doing your job or finding a, a different job. So it will it will transition people from something like the example that um, the article gave was when all this accounting software came out, it put a bunch of bookkeepers out of work, but it also changed the paradigm. And a lot of those people became managers and outsourced like lower value tasks. So it, it will have an impact for sure, but I don't think anybody can accurately guess to what that's going to be. I, um, I see the last one, which is how soon do I think AI will be common in the workforce? Uh, there's going to be some laggards and there's going to be a lot of people that are early adopters. And then there's going to be the, the, you know, the majority middle. I suspect that you're going to see AI. It, I actually think you're already seeing a bunch of it in the workplace already, either behind the scenes where people are using chat GPT on another computer doing or even on their work computer unauthorized or depends on every company's got different policies. I think a lot of people are already using it. I know in the, my real estate world, because there's no restrictions on what people can use, people are using AI for everything. And it's a huge part of the day-to-day -day life of the vast majority of real estate agents. Um, for your normal office worker, maybe it'll be probably next year. I think, I mean, I'm biased, clearly biased. I think just from what I've done playing around with Copilot, there's going to be a learning curve to figure out how to make, make, basically use it more effectively. But I think when people get the hack of, the, the, the hang of it and hack around with it, um, it's, it's really going to change the way that people do their work on a day-to-day -day basis. I literally get 700 or more emails a day in my Microsoft inbox and for, for me to be able to just go and ask it a summary of what's the most important thing I should work on based on the people that it knows I contact the most is going to be huge. I still don't know how that's going to work, but I feel like it's going to be huge. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, so I, I think from the chat perspective, there were a lot of people that wanted to see some chat in action. So am I still sharing the screen? So I'm gonna give you like a couple of different scenarios, maybe not the best examples, but these are, I'm gonna give it like a 101. So I copied and pasted this. Um, so write a paragraph that describes the solar system and provides unique details about each planet. Pretty straightforward, super simple for chat GPT. 
it's going to come in and it gives you this little, you know, blurb. Like in 10 seconds, it already wrote, you know, like one little quick paragraph about all the planets. That is what I call your basic chat. You tell it to write something and you give it, you know, what you want it to write about and it comes back with something. You could say expand on it. You, know, you can tell it a lot of different things so you can follow up. This is where the chat part comes in. I'm doing this on the fly. I didn't even think about this, but while we're there, so, all right. So it didn't tell me, it didn't do everything, but it kind of did put it in a bulleted list for each planet, giving me a sentence or two for each one, which I guess technically is a paragraph. So this is where it kind of comes into having a conversation with how chat GPT is going to work. So you, you can kind of control it. And it's not always a one shot thing. Um, so I'm going to go to the next one, which is like I call the, Next level. So this is my 201 type prompt. You're an expert astronomer with a talent for explaining complex complexity in a way that's easy to understand. Write a paragraph that describes the solar system and provides details about each planet. Write it in a tone. So this is a variable, so you can substitute different things and write it at a certain, uh oh, stop. Hit the wrong button. So now, So I stopped it because whatever was going off and doing its thing um, and it didn't have all of it. So first I added a new command, which is forget everything before this prompt. So if you're having a dialogue with chat GPT and you want to change something or you just want to refresh, you want to keep in the same chat, just tell it to forget everything before that prompt and you're basically starting over. So you're an extra, we went through this, so write a paragraph that describes the solar system of provides unique details about each planet Right in its tone. So the tone is important because you can, and it, I made it a variable so that you can change it and we can write it to a specific grade level audience. So quickly, who wants to decide what kind of tone do we want to give it? Anybody? Bueller? You may get that reference. Iris? Iris, raise your hand. You can come off mute and tell us what, what the tone should be. No, okay, grade sorry. level can be sixth grade. Sorry? Sixth Is grade level? Sixth grade. Okay. Sixth grade, and let's just say um, silly. So not as silly as I would like, but, um, you know, got nice words like comfy, temperature, and lots of yummy pizza. So there's lots of different things you can play around with it to, to go that next, you know, to the next level. So I have one more. And I am going to do this one is not so much. It doesn't have so many variables in it, but it's pretty detailed. So this is like you're an experienced teacher. And the reason I wanted to show this one is it gives you the ability to think about how can you brainstorm with chat GPT to do more. So I felt like this was maybe an important one from an academic stuff part. It's like, so your teacher gives you some kind of an assignment and you got to read the book or something else. And those are all still important things, but you want to supplement the education that they're giving you. You want to know more about a subject. So like this prompt is you're a highly experienced teacher with the ability to create simple step-by-step -step lessons on any subject that you, I want you to teach me about some topic, one concept at a time, give me a short engaging lesson to teach each one. Um, in here, there's a, make each lesson different than the previous one. Offer me a quiz so that you can go through it. And I can provide these to um, Isaac and the rest of this, this uh, robotics team to, um, 
to, to populate these so that people can do something else with them or just see them as an example. Because I don't want to read it all because I don't like to read. Uh, anyway, so with this one, it's going to give us a quiz about our favorite subject right now, astronomy. So it starts off with concept one, celestial stuff. Uh, I actually put the quiz in. The last time I did this, I tried it. It didn't actually put the quiz in. It asked if I wanted to do it. So it didn't quite follow the instructions. Um, and it didn't make it multiple choice. All right. But anyway, I could answer these. Oh, wait. Let's see. Uh, yeah, so just repeating, but I could do one astronomy. That'd be... Um, I'm just going to do this for sake of time, maybe. It's going to give me a poor grade. I can already tell. But the point is, like, it, it will create different things for you. And the more direction you give it, then the better it is. And it gives you the answers at the end or what it thinks the answers are. So this is a way to interact with the system and it can actually teach you things. It can help you guide you stuff. Um, I actually used it to, to um, help with my performance review, thinking about what are the important metrics? What do I want to get out of it? And I use ChatGPT to give me guidance on what, not just what I wanted to write, but to help me understand what I really wanted to accomplish. So there are tons of practical applications of how you could use ChatGPT or Copilot or any of the other systems. Um, one thing that I feel that's important to call out, so ChatGPT is just out on the internet, kind of to talk about the ethical things and just where data resides. So its power is being able to go off and find a lot of different things that are out there in the world and help you summarize them or help you brainstorm about them. But it, and it can learn stuff from you. In each one of the chats, as long as you keep that chat open, it will be able to go back and self-reference it. And they're kind of, think of them as siloed. You can actually go into your profile and set up a few other things. So it will start understanding your specific tone of voice. Um, so some of those things can be really helpful. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't really have a deep knowledge of you. It doesn't know that you're using Outlook or that you're using Gmail. It doesn't have the information of your contacts. And that's where Microsoft Copilot or I'm going to just Google whoever, any of the other companies that are out there that are going to do something in AI, the advantage that you're going to have with their version of whatever their AI system is going to be is they're going to be able to really tightly couple artificial intelligence with your own data and that's going to be pretty revolutionary for a lot of people. So I don't know what other questions. This pretty much has all the content that I have. And I feel like we've gone about three minutes over, but I wasn't watching until just now. Any other questions? Comments? Uh, yeah, I think someone um, joined late and they were just like kind of a summary of the meeting. <laughs> um, so, I mean, the high level summary is that, you know, we humans have been on an evolution from um, machine learning and artificial intelligence since the early 50s when computers were invented. Uh, we've made a lot of progress over that time, but we've essentially made exponential progress in the past five to six years with the advent of chat GPT, you being able to have generative text and really large language models at our disposal. They've essentially solved the problem of can computers understand how and what humans say? And then there are a tons of practical applications. The most obvious one what we've been going over is just being able to use chat GPT to improve your writing, to help you brainstorm and give you more power. And then companies like Microsoft and others 
are bringing the power AI into their own ecosystems to make workers more productive. Um, it's to be seen how that's going to go. Uh, but the data that, I mean, like my anecdotal stuff from just the week that I got to use Copilot so far, I see tons of potential in it for how it can make my day-to-day -day job and remove some of the most mundane and banal parts of it to make it so that I actually can focus on more of the work that I need to do and actually provide higher value and higher quality content in less time. That would be my summation. Cool. I had a question. Yeah. Um, when when th these AI companies get a bunch of the data that's fed from various other places, is that type of aggregation of data seen in other types of technology, or is AI really like the biggest data aggregates out there? And if it is, um, do you think that cybersecurity of that and like, if let's say OpenAI gets hacked and then they leak out information of hundreds of millions of users or data that they use in their back end. Do you think that there's now more potential for these cyber attacks to happen now that AI is developing more and more? Um, I mean, I think that's, I think in cybersecurity, there's always the possibility that somebody is going to get hacked. I would say from a chat GPT standpoint, it depends on what information you feed it, but it knows relatively little about me. I mean, their servers, they don't know any more about me than say Walmart or Amazon does. Amazon actually knows way more about me than anybody on the planet probably. Um, so I'm actually not as concerned about them being hacked from the perspective of them stealing, you know, Jason Andrews' data and doing something malicious with it. I'm more concerned with as sophisticated as users can be people that are, you know, that want to do bad are going to be able to like come up with like, oh, help me understand like the most common things, like the way that I can fool a contact center agent, the way that I can do spoofing, the way that I can do social engineering of people. And it will make access to that kind of data better. But it's, I don't think it's, I think, I don't think the paradigm changes any more than it does now. There's fraudsters out there. We deal with this financial institutions that are trying to take over people's banks accounts, steal money, et cetera, et cetera. And they're very sophisticated. I mean, that that is their job. I mean, uh, they take it maybe more serious than some other employees do that are getting paid for it, but that's, that's how they make their money. Uh, they're professional criminals and there's technology out there to help solve, stop them in a variety of ways. But I mean, to answer your question, I'm, I'm not as concerned about chat GPT or somebody else being hacked for individual user data because I don't think that there's that much they can do with that. Mm -hmm. um, I think the risk for people hacking companies is the same as it's always been. And that once they have the combination of your profile data, your passwords or something else, then there's a lot to that. And again, I would just say, I, I can't speak for Google and Amazon, but I do believe that they treat it every bit as as securely as what I what I know Microsoft to do. So I want to give them all everybody credit from a big tech standpoint. Everybody's trying to protect data as much as they can, at least from the Amazon and the the Google and Microsofts of the world. I have my I don't have any personal issue with Facebook, but they know so much about us that like I feel like that there's all kinds of things like that. But I think that they also take it as serious as they can. They just will sell it to marketers. Hi. Um, um, hi. Oh, yeah. I I have a quick question. So when you were using um, chat GPT to brainstorm a scientific, you know, um, subject and come yeah. up with a new idea and later on you derived a pattern over it. So will the intellectual property and goes to the chat GPT, the company or you? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, what I do know off the top of my head is that Microsoft has made a guarantee that if you're using chat GPT or actually being, uh, being searched to create something and there's a copyright file that they will indemnify users for that. So they're already on the, I know that they're doing stuff to take care of that. That's a little bit different than intellectual property. Um, 
but it's in the same vein. So my basic understanding is the stuff that you create is probably yours to use, um, but you don't have ownership of the systems that are used to create them, if that makes sense. So you get the product of it, um, but if somebody else asks it to do something very similar, that's probably going to produce a similar result, you'd probably find it hard to go after them for infringing on your copyright unless you could prove that you were the first one to produce it. And that gets into a, like a really murky gray area that I don't know all that much about. Thank you. Yeah. But I can tell you just like um, in the presentation, the lead um, intro slide, the picture on there was created by, um, by um, Bing Chat. You can go in there and ask it to create something for you. And I forget exactly what the prompt was that I used, but create like an AI cover slide for, for a presentation. Thank so you. It's pretty interesting what you can do. Um, this is for the Something audience. else I want to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to remind them. Um, we sent the link of the webinar survey into the chat. So please fill that out. I'll send it again. Um, this is going to help us to prepare our future STEM forums and overall make try to make your experience better. So I'll send it again. Please fill that out. There was a question, right? Um, and uh, that I was just going to wrap everything up. Um, okay. Uh, is If there's any other questions, let me look at the chat. Um, oh, yeah, there was one question that was like GPT-4 versus GPT-3, but I'm pretty sure like a Google search would be fine for that. Um, yeah. The biggest thing is oh, yeah, it does is better. GPT is GPT-4 worth it? It depends on what you're doing. If you're going to crunch large sets of numbers and want more more data analytics, then it's worth it. If you're not, if you don't need that, um, 3.5 is good enough for most everybody. But if you're gonna use it for any kind of data, or if you want, like if you look at some of the plugins and you want to do something like that, then that's where it comes in and it's really a personal decision. But um, I can tell you, I have it. I do use it for crunching some data on occasion. Um, it's pretty impressive what it can find in data. It's like literally having a data analyst working with you. You can just tell it what you want. If you can give it good instructions, it will find interesting data, um, you know, at, get interesting information out of any almost any data set. Um, and I think we, I think this is going to be the last question we'll do for today. Uh, where, from where do machine learning companies gather their data to make these models? That is a great question that I do not have the answer to. I do know that what I, well, I don't say I do know because I don't know. I believe that there's a consortium where they've all agreed to like have the same, some of the same sources of data, or at least I know that like that's what happened when they formed, formed the kind of the original like big language model back in 2016, I think it was. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, OpenAI actually has had web crawlers out there doing the same thing that Google and Microsoft and everybody else do, crawling the website for information. I just don't know how they augment it. Cool. Cool. So thanks, Jason, for coming out today. Thanks for doing. Uh, uh, thank the, you for having me. The, the first form of the school year. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. Uh, all, it was pretty interesting for me, and I'm sure it was interesting for other people. If you want to see more events like this in the future, I will put the link to to the mailing list in the chat now. I encourage you to sign up. It's definitely worth it. Just get notified when we're going to be hosting more things like this. Um, and and from there, we can, you, know, you, you guys can like see the events and then attend future events. So I'm Ayush. Um, I'm from FTC team area 52, uh, team number 18227. We do various activities like these. And if you want to learn more, uh, we have a website and things like that. Also, big thanks to Ariel and Isaac, who are our moderators for today. Uh, they were pretty, uh, they helped out a lot as well. So yeah, um, I think that's good. And if anybody else